Statute of the International Criminal Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia. Adopted by Security Council Resolution 827, 1993, of the 25th of May 1993. Having been established by the Security Council acting under Chapter 7 of the Charter of the United Nations, the International Tribunal for the Prosecution of Persons Responsible for Serious Violations of International Humanitarian Law Committed in the Territory of the Former Yugoslavia since 1991 here and after referred to as the International Tribunal, shall function in accordance with the provisions of the present statute. Article 1. Competence of the International Tribunal, the International Tribunal shall have the power to prosecute persons responsible for serious violations of international humanitarian law committed in the territory of the former Yugoslavia since 1991 in accordance with the provisions of the present statute. Article 2. Grave Breaches of the Geneva Conventions of 1949. The International Tribunal shall have the power to prosecute persons committing or ordering to be committed grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions of 12 August 1949, namely the following acts against persons or property protected under the provisions of the relevant Geneva Convention. a. Willful killing. b torture or unhuman treatment, including biological experiments. c. Willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body or health. d. Extensive destruction and appropriation of property, not justified by military necessity and carried out unlawfully and wantonly. e. Compelling a prisoner of war or a civilian to serve in the forces of a hostile power. f willfully depriving a prisoner of war or a civilian of the rights of fair and regular trial. g. Unlawful deportation or transfer or unlawful confinement of a civilian. h. Taking civilians as hostages. Article 3. Violations of the laws or customs of war, the International Tribunal shall have the power to prosecute persons violating the laws or customs of war. Such violations shall include, but not be limited to a. Employment of poisonous weapons or other weapons calculated to cause unnecessary suffering b. Wanton destruction of cities, towns or villages, or devastation not justified by military necessity c. Attack, or bombardment, by whatever means, of undefended towns, villages, dwellings, or buildings d seizure of, destruction or willful damage done to institutions dedicated to religion, charity and education, the arts and sciences, historic monuments and works of art and science. e. Plunder of public or private property. Article 4. Genocide. 1. The International Tribunal shall have the power to prosecute persons committing genocide as defined in paragraph 2 of this article or of committing any of the other acts enumerated in paragraph 3 of this article. 2. Genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial or religious group, as such. a. Killing members of the group b. Causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. c. Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. d. Attempt to commit genocide, e. Complicity in genocide. Article 5. Crimes Against Humanity. The International Tribunal shall have the power to prosecute persons responsible for the following crimes when committed in armed conflict, whether international or internal in character, and directed against any civilian population. a. Murder. b. Extermination. c. Enslavement. d. Deportation. e. Imprisonment. f. Torture. g. Rape. H. Persecutions on political, racial and religious grounds. I. Other inhumane acts. Article 6. Personal jurisdiction, 
the International Tribunal shall have jurisdiction over natural persons pursuant to the provisions of the present statute. Article 7. Individual Criminal Responsibility, 1. A person who planned, instigated, ordered, committed or otherwise aided and abetted in the planning, preparation or execution of a crime referred to in Articles 2 to 5 of the present statute, shall be individually responsible for the crime. 2. The official position of any accused person, whether as head of state or government or as a responsible government official, shall not relieve such person of criminal responsibility nor mitigate punishment. 3. The fact that any of the acts referred to in Articles 2 to 5 of the present statute was committed by a subordinate does not relieve his superior of criminal responsibility if he knew or had reason to know that the subordinate was about to commit such acts or had done so and the superior failed to take the necessary and reasonable measures to prevent such acts or to punish the perpetrators thereof. 4. The fact that an accused person acted pursuant to an order of a government or of a superior shall not relieve him of criminal responsibility, but may be considered in mitigation of punishment if the international tribunal determines that justice so requires. Article 8. Territorial and Temporal Jurisdiction the territorial jurisdiction of the International Tribunal shall extend to the territory of the former Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, including its land surface, airspace and territorial waters. The temporal jurisdiction of the International Tribunal shall extend to a period beginning on 1 January 1991. Article 9. Concurrent Jurisdiction, 1. The International Tribunal and National Courts shall have concurrent jurisdiction to prosecute persons for serious violations of international humanitarian law committed in the territory of the former Yugoslavia since 1 January 1991. 2. The International Tribunal shall have primacy over national courts. At any stage of the procedure. The International Tribunal may formally request national courts to defer to the competence of the International Tribunal in accordance with the present statute and the rules of procedure and evidence of the International Tribunal. Article 10. Non bis in idem. 1. No person shall be tried before a national court for acts constituting serious violations of international humanitarian law under the present statute for which he or she has already been tried by the International Tribunal. 2. A person who has been tried by a national court for acts constituting serious violations of international humanitarian law may be subsequently tried by the International Tribunal only if a. The act for which he or she was tried was characterized as an ordinary crime or b. The national court proceedings were not impartial or independent were designed to shield the accused from international criminal responsibility, or the case was not diligently prosecuted. 3. In considering the penalty to be imposed on a person convicted of a crime under the present statute, the International Tribunal shall take into account the extent to which any penalty imposed by a national court on the same person for the same act has already been served. Article 11 organization of the International Tribunal, the International Tribunal shall consist of the following organs, a, the chambers, comprising three trial chambers and an appeals chamber, b, the prosecutor and, c, a registry, servicing both the chambers and the prosecutor. Article 12. Composition of the chambers, 1. The chambers shall be composed of a maximum of 16 permanent independent judges, no two of whom may be nationals of the same state, and a maximum at any one time of twelve ad litem independent judges appointed in accordance with Article 13 ter, paragraph 2, of the statute, no two of whom may be nationals of the same state. 2. A maximum at any one time of three permanent judges and six ad litem judges shall be members of each trial chamber. Each trial chamber to which ad litem judges are assigned may be divided into sections of three judges each, composed of both permanent and ad litem judges, 
except in the circumstances specified in paragraph 5 below. A section of a trial chamber shall have the same powers and responsibilities as a trial chamber under the statute and shall render judgment in accordance with the same rules. 3. Seven of the permanent judges shall be members of the appeals chamber. The appeals chamber shall, for each appeal, be composed of five of its members. 4. A person who for the purposes of membership of the chambers of the International Tribunal could be regarded as a national of more than one state shall be deemed to be a national of the state in which that person ordinarily exercises civil and political rights. 5. The Secretary General may, at the request of the President of the International Tribunal appoint, from among the ad litem judges elected in accordance with Article 13 ter, reserve judges to be present at each stage of a trial to which they have been appointed and to replace a judge if the judge is unable to continue sitting. 6. Without prejudice to paragraph 2 above, in the event that exceptional circumstances require for a permanent judge in a section of a trial chamber to be replaced resulting in a section solely comprised of ad litem judges, that section may continue to hear the case, notwithstanding that its composition no longer includes a permanent judge. Article 13. Qualifications of Judges the permanent and ad litem judges shall be persons of high moral character, impartiality and integrity who possess the qualifications required in their respective countries for appointment to the highest judicial offices. In the overall composition of the chambers and sections of the trial chambers, due account shall be taken of the experience of the judges in criminal law, international law, including international humanitarian law and human rights law. Article 13 bis. Election of Permanent Judges. 1. 14 of the permanent judges of the International Tribunal shall be elected by the General Assembly from a list submitted by the Security Council, in the following manner. a. The Secretary General shall invite nominations for judges of the International Tribunal from states members of the United Nations and non-member states maintaining permanent observer missions at United Nations headquarters. b. Within 60 days of the date of the invitation of the Secretary General, each state may nominate up to two candidates meeting the qualifications set out in Article 13 of the Statute no two of whom shall be of the same nationality and neither of whom shall be of the same nationality as any judge who is a member of the appeals chamber and who was elected or appointed a permanent judge of the International Criminal Tribunal for the prosecution of persons responsible for genocide and other serious violations of international humanitarian law committed in the territory of Rwanda and Rwandan citizens responsible for genocide and other such violations committed in the territory of neighboring states between the 1st of January 1994 and the 31st of December 1994, herein after referred to as the International Tribunal for Rwanda, in accordance with Article 12 bys of the Statute of that Tribunal. c. The Secretary General shall forward the nominations received to the Security Council. From the nominations received, the Security Council shall establish a list of not less than 28 and not more than 42 candidates, taking due account of the adequate representation of the principal legal systems of the world. d. The President of the Security Council shall transmit the list of candidates to the President of the General Assembly. From that list, the General Assembly shall elect 14 permanent judges of the International Tribunal. The candidates who receive an absolute majority of the votes of the state's members of the United Nations and of the non-member states maintaining permanent observer missions at United Nations headquarters, shall be declared elected. Should two candidates of the same nationality obtain the required majority vote, the one who received the higher number of votes shall be considered elected. 2. In the event of a vacancy in the chambers amongst the permanent judges elected or appointed in accordance with this article, after consultation with the Presidents of the Security Council and of the General Assembly, the Secretary General shall appoint a person meeting the qualifications of Article 13 of the Statute, 
for the remainder of the term of office concerned. 3. The permanent judges elected in accordance with this article shall be elected for a term of four years. The terms and conditions of service shall be those of the judges of the International Court of Justice. They shall be eligible for re-election. Article 13 de. Election and appointment of ad litem judges. 1. The ad litem judges of the International Tribunal shall be elected by the General Assembly from a list submitted by the Security Council, in the following manner. a. The Secretary General shall invite nominations for ad litem judges of the International Tribunal from states members of the United Nations and non-member states maintaining permanent observer missions at United Nations headquarters. b. Within 60 days of the date of the invitation of the Secretary General, each state may nominate up to four candidates meeting the qualifications set out in Article 13 of the Statute, taking into account the importance of a fair representation of female and male candidates. c. The Secretary General shall forward the nominations received to the Security Council. From the nominations received the Security Council shall establish a list of not less than 54 candidates, taking due account of the adequate representation of the principal legal systems of the world and bearing in mind the importance of equitable geographical distribution. d. The President of the Security Council shall transmit the list of candidates to the President of the General Assembly. From that list the General Assembly shall elect the 27 ad litem judges of the International Tribunal. The candidates who receive an absolute majority of the votes of the state's members of the United Nations and of the non-member states maintaining permanent observer missions at United Nations headquarters shall be declared elected. e. The ad litem judges shall be elected for a term of four years. They shall be eligible for re-election. 2. During any term, ad litem judges will be appointed by the Secretary General, upon request of the President of the International Tribunal, to serve in the trial chambers for one or more trials, for a cumulative period of up to, but not including, three years. When requesting the appointment of any particular ad litem judge, the President of the International Tribunal shall bear in mind the criteria set out in Article 13 of the Statute regarding the composition of the chambers and sections of the trial chambers, the considerations set out in paragraphs 1, b, and, c, above and the number of votes the ad litem judge received in the General Assembly. Article 13 Quater Status of ad litem judges, 1. During the period in which they are appointed to serve in the International Tribunal, ad litem judges shall, a, benefit from the same terms and conditions of service mutatis mutandis as the permanent judges of the International Tribunal, b, enjoy, subject to paragraph 2 below, the same powers as the permanent judges of the International Tribunal, c, enjoy the privileges and immunities, exemptions and facilities of a judge of the International Tribunal, d. Enjoy the power to adjudicate in pretrial proceedings in cases other than those that they have been appointed to try. 2. During the period in which they are appointed to serve in the International Tribunal, ad litem judges shall not a. Be eligible for election as, or to vote in the election of, the President of the Tribunal or the Presiding Judge of a Trial Chamber pursuant to Article 14 of the Statute. b. Have power. i. To adopt rules of procedure and evidence pursuant to Article 15 of the Statute. They shall, however, be consulted before the adoption of those rules. 2. To review an indictment pursuant to Article 19 of the Statute. 3 to consult with the President in relation to the assignment of judges pursuant to Article 14 of the Statute or in relation to a pardon or commutation of sentence pursuant to Article 28 of the Statute. 3. Notwithstanding, paragraphs 1 and 2 above, an ad litem judge who is serving as a reserve judge shall, during such time as he or she so serves, a. 
benefit from the same terms and conditions of service mutatis mutandis as the permanent judges of the International Tribunal. b. Enjoy the privileges and immunities, exemptions and facilities of a judge of the International Tribunal. c. Enjoy the power to adjudicate in pretrial proceedings in cases other than those that they have been appointed to and for that purpose to enjoy subject to paragraph 2 above, the same powers as permanent judges. 4. In the event that a reserve judge replaces a judge who is unable to continue sitting, he or she will, as of that time, benefit from the provisions of paragraph 1 above. Article 14. Officers and members of the chambers, 1. The permanent judges of the International Tribunal shall elect a president from amongst their number. 2. The president of the International Tribunal shall be a member of the appeals chamber and shall preside over its proceedings. 3. After consultation with the permanent judges of the International Tribunal, the President shall assign four of the permanent judges elected or appointed in accordance with Article 13 bys of the Statute to the Appeals Chamber and nine to the Trial Chambers. Notwithstanding the provisions of Article 12, Paragraph 1, and Article 12, Paragraph 3, the President may assign to the Appeals Chamber up to four additional permanent judges serving in the Trial Chambers on the completion of the cases to which each judge is assigned. The term of office of each judge redeployed to the appeals chamber shall be the same as the term of office of the judges serving in the appeals chamber. 4. Two of the permanent judges of the International Tribunal for Rwanda elected or appointed in accordance with Article 12 bys of the statute of that tribunal shall be assigned by the President of that tribunal in consultation with the President of the International Tribunal, to be members of the Appeals Chamber and permanent judges of the International Tribunal. Notwithstanding the provisions of Article 12, Paragraph 1, and Article 12, Paragraph 3, up to four additional permanent judges serving in the trial chambers of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda may be assigned to the Appeals Chamber by the President of that tribunal, on the completion of the cases to which each judge is assigned. The term of office of each judge redeployed to the appeals chamber shall be the same as the term of office of the judges serving in the appeals chamber. 5. After consultation with the permanent judges of the International Tribunal, the President shall assign such ad litem judges as may from time to time be appointed to serve in the International Tribunal to the trial chambers. 6. A judge shall serve only in the chamber to which he or she was assigned. 7. The permanent judges of each trial chamber shall elect a presiding judge from amongst their number, who shall oversee the work of the trial chamber as a whole. Article 15. Rules of Procedure and Evidence. The judges of the International Tribunal shall adopt rules of procedure and evidence for the conduct of the pretrial phase of the proceedings, trials and appeals, the admission of evidence, the protection of victims and witnesses and other appropriate matters. Article 16. The Prosecutor, 1. The prosecutor shall be responsible for the investigation and prosecution of persons responsible for serious violations of international humanitarian law committed in the territory of the former Yugoslavia since 1 January 1991. 2. The prosecutor shall act independently as a separate organ of the international tribunal. He or she shall not seek or receive instructions from any government or from any other source. 3. The office of the prosecutor shall be composed of a prosecutor and such other qualified staff as may be required. 4. The prosecutor shall be appointed by the Security Council on nomination by the Secretary General. He or she shall be of high moral character and possess the highest level of competence and experience in the conduct of investigations and prosecutions of criminal cases. The prosecutor shall serve for a four-year term and be eligible for reappointment. The terms and conditions of service of the prosecutor shall be those of an Under-Secretary-General of the United Nations.
5. The staff of the Office of the Prosecutor shall be appointed by the Secretary General on the recommendation of the Prosecutor. Article 17. The Registry, 1. The Registry shall be responsible for the administration and servicing of the International Tribunal. 2. The Registry shall consist of a Registrar and such other staff as may be required. 3. The Registrar shall be appointed by the Secretary General after consultation with the President of the International Tribunal. He or she shall serve for a four-year term and be eligible for reappointment. The terms and conditions of service of the Registrar shall be those of an Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. 4. The staff of the Registry shall be appointed by the Secretary General on the recommendation of the Registrar. Article 18. Investigation and Preparation of Indictment 1. The prosecutor shall initiate investigations ex officio or on the basis of information obtained from any source, particularly from governments, United Nations organs, intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations. The prosecutor shall assess the information received or obtained and decide whether there is sufficient basis to proceed. 2. The prosecutor shall have the power to question suspects, victims and witnesses, to collect evidence and to conduct on-site investigations. In carrying out these tasks, the prosecutor may, as appropriate, seek the assistance of the state authorities concerned. 3. If questioned, the suspect shall be entitled to be assisted by counsel of his own choice including the right to have legal assistance assigned to him without payment by him in any such case if he does not have sufficient means to pay for it, as well as to necessary translation into and from a language he speaks and understands. 4. Upon a determination that a prima facie case exists, the prosecutor shall prepare an indictment containing a concise statement of the facts and the crime or crimes with which the accused is charged under the statute. The indictment shall be transmitted to a judge of the trial chamber. Article 19. Review of the indictment. 1. The judge of the trial chamber to whom the indictment has been transmitted shall review it. If satisfied that a prima facie case has been established by the prosecutor, he shall confirm the indictment. If not so satisfied, the indictment shall be dismissed. 2. Upon confirmation of an indictment, the judge may, at the request of the prosecutor, issue such orders and warrants for the arrest, detention, surrender or transfer of persons, and any other orders as may be required for the conduct of the trial. Article 20. Commencement and Conduct of Trial Proceedings 1. The trial chambers shall ensure that a trial is fair and expeditious and that proceedings are conducted in accordance with the rules of procedure and evidence, with full respect for the rights of the accused and due regard for the protection of victims and witnesses. 2. A person against whom an indictment has been confirmed shall, pursuant to an order or an arrest warrant of the International Tribunal, be taken into custody immediately informed of the charges against him and transferred to the International Tribunal. 3. The trial chamber shall read the indictment, satisfy itself that the rights of the accused are respected, confirm that the accused understands the indictment, and instruct the accused to enter a plea. The trial chamber shall then set the date for trial. 4. The hearings shall be public unless the trial chamber decides to close the proceedings in accordance with its rules of procedure and evidence. Article 21. Rights of the accused. 1. All persons shall be equal before the international tribunal. 2. In the determination of charges against him, the accused shall be entitled to a fair and public hearing subject to Article 22 of the Statute. 3. The accused shall be presumed innocent until proved guilty according to the provisions of the present statute. 4. In the determination of any charge against the accused pursuant to the present statute, 
the accused shall be entitled to the following minimum guarantees, in full equality. a. To be informed promptly and in detail in a language which he understands of the nature and cause of the charge against him. b. To have adequate time and facilities for the preparation of his defense and to communicate with counsel of his own choosing. c. To be tried without undue delay. d. To be tried in his presence and to defend himself in person or through legal assistance of his own choosing to be informed, if he does not have legal assistance, of this right and to have legal assistance assigned to him, in any case where the interests of justice so require, and without payment by him in any such case if he does not have sufficient means to pay for it. e. To examine, or have examined the witnesses against him and to obtain the attendance and examination of witnesses on his behalf under the same conditions as witnesses against him. f. To have the free assistance of an interpreter if he cannot understand or speak the language used in the international tribunal. g. Not to be compelled to testify against himself or to confess guilt. Article 22 protection of victims and witnesses, the International Tribunal shall provide in its rules of procedure and evidence for the protection of victims and witnesses. Such protection measures shall include, but shall not be limited to, the conduct of in-camera proceedings and the protection of the victim's identity. Article 23. Judgment, 1. The trial chambers shall pronounce judgments and impose sentences and penalties on persons convicted of serious violations of international humanitarian law. 2. The judgment shall be rendered by a majority of the judges of the trial chamber, and shall be delivered by the trial chamber in public. It shall be accompanied by a reasoned opinion in writing, to which separate or dissenting opinions may be appended. Article 24 penalties, 1. The penalty imposed by the trial chamber shall be limited to imprisonment. In determining the terms of imprisonment, the trial chambers shall have recourse to the general practice regarding prison sentences in the courts of the former Yugoslavia. 2. In imposing the sentences, the trial chambers should take into account such factors as the gravity of the offense and the individual circumstances of the convicted person. 3. In addition to imprisonment, the trial chambers may order the return of any property and proceeds acquired by criminal conduct, including by means of duress, to their rightful owners. Article 25. Appellate Proceedings, 1. The Appeals Chamber shall hear appeals from persons convicted by the trial chambers or from the prosecutor on the following grounds, a an error on a question of law invalidating the decision or, b, an error of fact which has occasioned a miscarriage of justice. 2. The appeals chamber may affirm, reverse or revise the decisions taken by the trial chambers. Article 26. Review proceedings, where a new fact has been discovered which was not known at the time of the proceedings before the trial chambers or the appeals chamber and which could have been a decisive factor in reaching the decision, the convicted person or the prosecutor may submit to the International Tribunal an application for review of the judgment. Article 27. Enforcement of Sentences Imprisonment shall be served in a state designated by the International Tribunal from a list of states which have indicated to the Security Council their willingness to accept convicted persons. Such imprisonment shall be in accordance with the applicable law of the state concerned, subject to the supervision of the International Tribunal. Article 28. Pardon or commutation of sentences, if pursuant to the applicable law of the state in which the convicted person is imprisoned, he or she is eligible for pardon or commutation of sentence, the state concerned shall notify the International Tribunal accordingly. The President of the International Tribunal, in consultation with the judges, shall decide the matter on the basis of the interests of justice and the general principles of law. Article 29 Cooperation and Rejudicial Assistance, 1. 
states shall cooperate with the International Tribunal in the investigation and prosecution of persons accused of committing serious violations of international humanitarian law. 2. States shall comply without undue delay with any request for assistance or an order issued by a trial chamber, including, but not limited to, a. The identification and location of persons. b. The taking of testimony and the production of evidence. c. The service of documents. d. The arrest or detention of persons. e. The surrender or the transfer of the accused to the International Tribunal. Article 30. The status, privileges and immunities of the International Tribunal, 1. The Convention on the Privileges and Immunities of the United Nations of 13 February 1946 shall apply to the International Tribunal, the judges, the prosecutor and his staff, and the registrar and his staff. 2. The judges, the prosecutor and the registrar shall enjoy the privileges and immunities, exemptions and facilities accorded to diplomatic envoys, in accordance with international law. 3. The staff of the prosecutor and of the registrar shall enjoy the privileges and immunities accorded to officials of the United Nations under Articles V and VII of the Convention referred to in paragraph 1 of this article. 4. Other persons, including the accused, required at the seat of the International Tribunal shall be accorded such treatment as is necessary for the proper functioning of the International Tribunal. Article 31 seat of the International Tribunal, the International Tribunal shall have its seat at The Hague. Article 32. Expenses of the International Tribunal, the expenses of the International Tribunal shall be borne by the regular budget of the United Nations in accordance with Article 17 of the Charter of the United Nations. Article 33. Working Languages. The working languages of the International Tribunal shall be English and French. Article 34. Annual Report. The President of the International Tribunal shall submit an annual report of the International Tribunal to the Security Council and to the General Assembly.